Welcome to Positive Recovery MD. If you're listening, chances are you want to create happiness around you and thrive in your life. We're glad you're here and you've come to the right place. This podcast will inspire and motivate you to not merely survive your recovery journey, will give you the tools to build or strengthen your foundation to thrive and flourish in your life. Each week, we'll come together as a community to have authentic conversations around addiction, recovery, and what matters, growth and progress, not perfection, all while developing positive habits for you to utilize in your life. To learn more, please visit PositiveRecoveryMD.com to sign up to receive the daily positive interventions that we'll review, as well as gain access to exclusive Positive Recovery content available only to Positive Recovery MD listeners. All right, let's get started. Welcome to yet another installment of Positive Recovery MD's podcast with one of your hosts, Jason Powers, and here with Julie DeNova. Hey guys, I'm so excited for today. And I probably say that every week because I think every Friday that I come rolling in the studio, I feel excited. But particularly so today, as a nurse, being able to sit at the table with two of my most favorite doctors that are in addiction medicine space. And I don't even know if Dr. Leith knows that. I'm pretty stoked about today. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. We have a doctor guest on, actually a good buddy of mine. If I had an ARC and I can only save 40 people, he'd be on. We cut our teeth together. When I was brand new learning addiction medicine, he, he was there, helped me along. And, you know, he and I are chief medical officers at uh, two places in Houston and, and we're not at all competitive. In fact, we're, we're pretty good friends. And um, we just realized we hadn't seen each other in eight years. Like, oh my God. Uh, one of my good friends, Dr. Mike Leith, chief medical officer of Memorial Hermann Prevention and Recovery Center. Welcome. Thank you. Thank, I, it's really a kick to be here. Uh, when you let me know a few weeks ago, you were doing these podcasts, I thought that's that's really a great idea. And then you asked me to be on one of them. And I thought, oh, that's an awesome idea. Yeah. <laughs> awesome idea. <laughs> Sounded even better then, huh? And, and I get to see Julie. So this is, a, this is a real treat for me. And yeah, you're right. I don't know that I helped you get started in addiction medicine. I think you and I kind of jumped off in this together. And we sort of held hands as we kind of each learned and taught the other. It was, but you were a great partner. And you made learning fun. You really did. I mean, I think we had a lot of fun as we... Yeah, we did. We had some we had some interesting bosses along the way. So, you know, you were in recovery and, and we'll get to your story in a, in a bit. But when I started doing addiction medicine, all I had was a passion and maybe a year and a half in recovery. So I, I was brand new and I, I show up one day and I just got a patient list. And I was like, Mike, what the hell do we do? I mean, I, I you know, I knew physical medicine and I knew that I was in recovery and I could speak like 12 step speak. But man, I didn't I didn't really know. And and God, I was so fortunate. I know you said we held each other's hands, but like you were a pharmacist first. So your your depth of knowledge where it counted was amazing. And you are smarter. You're probably one of the smartest doctors I know. You, you're too humble at this point to say so. But I do understand from your story, you weren't always this humble, which which will be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, but i um, glad you think so. Exactly. He is really one of the, he's so humble. It's going to be hard to give him compliments, but, but we'll try to sneak some in. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we took our, we took the addiction boards together. I think we joined ASAM together. We did a family medicine review course and took that together. And it is great to have you on. And Thank you. so give us a little bit of, of your history, sort of like, how did you get into doing what you're doing? Well, I kind of came in through the back door, I guess, through a series of, um, misunderstandings and so forth. No, that's a joke. Actually, I did sort of come in the back door. I didn't even know addiction medicine was a specialty. I'd been family medicine doctor. I'd been part of an ER group. And then I ended up getting into a lot of trouble, went before the medical board, lost my license for a year, worked as a plumber's helper, which was what needed to happen to me. It re- I really needed to be taken down a few notches, and that did it. But it was a great year. And actually, I learned some very practical, cool stuff, worked with some cool guys on the plumbing crew. And then when I got my, when the medical board reinstated my license, Gene Degner, Dr. Gene Degner, who I think probably taught most more people addiction medicine around here than anyone else, he had asked me about what I think about addiction medicine. I didn't know, didn't know what he meant. I said, like, uh, yeah, I think it's cool, Gene. Um, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> he said, well, what, do you, what would you think about maybe trying it? I said, you mean it's a job? He said, yeah, it's a job. And I thought, well, you know, the e- I thought to myself, well, the, the emergency rooms aren't calling me back. And I kind of thought that would happen, but that's not happening. And I need a job. And thought that, yeah, yeah, Gene, I'll do that. Knowing that within a few months, I'll be back in in the emergency room. Well, that was, what, 17 years ago? Something like that? And so 
after doing it just for a few weeks, I thought, man, this is bad to the bone. I'm getting to practice medicine. I'm actually getting to help people. I mean, really help people who are down, down like I was down. Was this after your relapse while on board order? R- relapse is plural on board order. Um, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, let's yeah, back up. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. So w- once I finally, once I finally got it, I got it. Until then, I was playing games. I was, I, I consider myself as a pharmacist and a doctor. I thought I've forgotten more about medicine. These people are going to know I was wrong <laughs> <laughs> on two levels. One, I didn't. They, their their drug screens, I guess advanced faster than I thought they were advancing. <laughs> right. You're trying to beat the system. And I was pretty good at it for a while until I wasn't. And then another thing is I, I knew pharmacology and I knew medicine, but I didn't know addiction. Yeah. And I was an addict. And that's what I didn't know. So I think our listeners, what, what they want to hear is, what were you thinking? How did you try to beat it? So I'm going to back you up. You were a pharmacist before you were an MD. That's right. Okay. So where did you go to college? Let's start there. I went to Kilgore Junior College for a year, then to A&M. That's why your kids go to a and I was wondering. <laughs> That's right. They want dad to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, yeah, you have one choice. <laughs> well, actually, and my, my daughter almost went to Texas, so I was sweating bullets. I knew she was good. And I, and I, but she ended up at a and <laughs> uh, Nobody's yeah, perfect. With all three of the kids, though, Christy, my wife, and I took a very hands-off approach to let them make the decision themselves. Having grown up as an Aggie, though. All they heard was gig them. That's all they heard yeah. by design. By oh, design. Like I said, nobody's perfect. <laughs> Hook them horns, by the way. I, I, want, I graduated medical school at UT. That, yeah. Or UTMB. That, that's why you you have redeeming qualities. Right. That, so, okay. So you go to pharmacy school. I know you worked at Avalon. I did. You did Avalon drug. near St. John's, yeah. right? That's sort of like one of our talking points. And what made you decide to be a doctor of medicine instead of, of pharmacy? Well, I wanted, I wanted to go to medical school. And, but back then, it was really hard to get in. I mean, everybody had high MCATs. Everybody had high GPAs. Everybody, you know, there's there a lot of great applicants, and, and most people didn't get in. And so I thought, well, if, in, in the event I don't get in, which is statistically likely to happen, I wanted to have a, a job that, A, I found interesting, and B, that would provide me a good living. And pharmacy just seemed to fit that. I'd worked in drugstores, actually delivered medicine, drove a delivery car back home, you know, so I thought... And the pharmacists that I've gotten to know back home are really cool guys. And I, thought, I, I really like what they do. So I didn't know that. You, so did you, did you apply and not get in med school and then went? No, no, no not at all. I, I just, it was just hard to get in. So I mean, you didn't even try? To get my undergraduate degree, I, I was, it was either going to be bio, biology, chemistry, or biochem. Or I thought, oh, I can get a pharmacy degree. It's like an extra year oh. or so. But I think it's going to enhance my chances of getting in. Or if I don't get in... I'll have a good living. He had a good plan B is what he's saying. Yeah, so yeah. you did plan B first. Okay, I get it. I did. But it was also a stepping stone, which, yeah. okay, that makes sense. Or plan A prime, maybe. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. And, and so- So that was your original plan, okay. He was covering all his bases. I understand. I did, and I, but I think it probably enhanced me and helped me get, I mean, I got in when I, when I applied to medical school, I got in, so I, I think- You would have got in anyway. I don't know. Your MCAT was probably like higher than mine. You, you probably it was okay. Killed it. it was good. It was better <laughs> my GPA. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, mine too. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I got in. But okay, so then you you become a doctor. You're you know you you went to UTMB Medical School. I did, and then residency in family medicine here in Houston at Southwest. Your program. That's right. Yeah. How how many years ahead of me were you? About ten, I think. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I am the one sitting here with gray hair. Yeah. Well. Pfft. I got a lot, but okay, I forgot. I totally forgot. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, great, great residency. You weren't sober, but were you bad off? Like when you started out? No, I was, I was uh, an a alcohol enthusiast. <laughs> 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 I really enjoyed having fun. And, and I was, I think I just kind of continued that, that fraternity lifestyle. My roommate in residency was a buddy of mine from my fraternity. And we just kind of kept it going. Like med school fraternity? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. just kind of kept it going. And then I graduated and I just sort of kept it going. So dr- how much were you drinking? No. I mean, I, I probably should know that. I, I, I don't really. Like just I, out. It's not like you were hitting the bottle every day. No, not no. Not, not at all. But I would play. I mean, I, mean, I got up, I ran, rode my bike, worked out every morning, worked. I mean, I had a busy practice as part of an ER group, played tennis on a local level. But yeah. Semi-competitive tennis, you know, two or three, sometimes four times a week. So I was pretty active, but the guys that I ran around with, we would always go to the Richmond Arms or where I don't mean to, to plug a local bar, but in this It's context, okay. They're, they're sponsoring today's episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So, so that's sort of what we did. If you want to hear like, my story. I do. I, our listeners do. Okay. So well, how did it get bad? It got bad. So I drank heavily, even alcoholically in retrospect. Where I really developed a problem, though, was I was in private practice. I was going through an acrimonious divorce. That's right. And I, my oldest son is now 26. He's a little bitty boy then. And so uh, I was going through some child custody. I was worried about losing him. And I had this headache. It, w- for, it went on for days. It wouldn't go away. I tried all the typical stuff, and it wouldn't go away. And I had hydrocodone, a lot of it, because I did a lot of procedures. We sampled a lot of hydrocodone today. And I didn't want to take it because I'd taken it two other occasions. Once I'd taken it when I had my wisdom teeth extracted in pharmacy school, it made me sick. Had it again, and I had a car hit me on a motorcycle when I was in medical school, had surgery, and I didn't like the narcotics. It made me sick. So I was really reluctant to take it again. Right. And what you said really quick for our listeners is that you got them sampled. Like today, uh, drug reps will give samples of things like antidepressants and things for blood pressure. And it's no longer legal to give out samples of pain medicine. But you had a lot of samples. Right. right. So this was back. This is in the day. And, and for instance, like an OBGYN would have like just tons and tons of birth control pills. A pediatrician would have tons of like liquid antibiotics. Right. I did a lot of procedures as part of the ER. So I did a lot of, I took care of a lot of pain. So I had a lot of Prescriptions of pain medicine. Right. So, okay. So then you started taking for I the headache. One. I took one for a headache, for this headache that wouldn't go away. And I can tell you where I was standing when that feeling hit me. Mm. To this day, I remember the first pill where I was standing when that feeling came over. Mm. And it was just every bit of anxiety. I didn't know what, I didn't know that that feeling in my gut was anxiety. I didn't know, I didn't know that what I was experiencing was anxiety and it went away. And I felt like I had, was made out of Teflon. Yeah. That's what a lot of, I, feel, I could tell you the same thing. Yeah, a lot of addicts say that was the most normal I ever felt when I fill in the blank. That's it. And, and I, yeah, and it was, that's what I felt. I didn't feel wildly high. I just felt normal. But I, but I remember where that, but that was, it was so incredible to feel normal. Right. Yeah. I mean, you still had the acrimonious divorce, worried about custody, but those, those feelings weren't in the forefront, like bogging you down, occupying you, no longer the stress headache. And you feel like, and this is the illusion that, okay, well, I, now I can get on with the rest of my life with, you know, with zip and, and some vigor. Of course, it's like crazy. It's illusionary. But then, so I'm guessing that that one turned into a habit, turned into. Yeah, absolutely. You know where that was. So how did you get, so, okay, it progresses. And like you, that was my drug of choice. I have a DEA license. You didn't even have to be as creative as I did because I didn't have samples. I had to purchase from, and remember the funny stories, like I would buy them from manufacturers, but I had to dilute the order because I didn't want the DEA to see, oh, he's only buying bottles of hydrocodone or whatever. So I bought supplies for my private practice. When I got sober, I like up to the ceiling of shit I never used. I had all these casting supplies. I had a baby <laughs> one scale. I remember I went over to your house one day and you had all this incredible stuff, well, EKG machines and all that other stuff. Oh no, so, well that, because I did, remember I did the house calls. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, but, no, th- that was actually useful, but all the, like the casting stuff and the baby scale and all this other bullshit that I <laughs> did not need. So, okay, how did you get, caught? Like what, what was it like right before and sort of what was the intervention, the first one? I got a call from, from the head of the ER one night. Hey, um, you're scheduled on the, you're on the schedule tomorrow. You'll, you'll, sometimes we would switch schedule, you know, switch shifts and all that. He goes, I just want to make sure you'll be here tomorrow. I said, yeah, I'll be here. Why, why do you ask? He goes, we need to have a talk. I thought, Uh-oh. Yeah. But you know what? I don't know that I put it together. I was oh, like, really? <laughs> so oblivious. Yeah. Uh-huh. I wonder what this is going to be about. Hmm. Huh. Either way, so he shows up and he, uh, I show up and he's there and we were all sort of friends. I know this is a hard conversation he had to have with me, right? but he was, you know, um, saying that he had had, he had gotten a, a phone call that I was abusing drugs. I said, what? You know, I think I even act offended. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I'm not abusing them. I'm taking them yeah. for. Yeah. yeah. Right. Did that, don't you remember that I'm a pharmacist? Don't you remember how much I know about drugs? Didn't that work. That's my thought. I don't think I actually said that because I was so gobsmacked by the right. fact that somebody was calling me out. Right. You know, so he said, you need to call the board. I said, okay, I'll do that. He goes, no, oh, you the phone. need to call the board. Right. And I did and, and, and self-reported, but my head was still spinning. I remember thinking, oh, I got to figure, I, I got to figure this out. I mean, this is, you know. How much were you taking at that point? Not a lot, probably under 20 a day, under 20. Under so it gets worse later. Well, no, that, that was, I got off a of hydrocodone. That was the last I took. Oh. I took no more of that. But alcohol? Because that was my problem. Right. That's it. My problem was what I got caught at. 
that's but Jason, that's how my brain worked. So when they were drug screening you, you got an order, you're on order, they're testing you, but you didn't realize they were testing you for alcohol. Is was that the yeah. deal or what kind of they didn't really test they would do these blow these uh breathalyzers every so often, but uh, they never did on the weekends. And they didn't test for ethyl glucuronide. They wasn't around back then. That, so there's a metabolite we test today that lasts for four up to four days yeah. right now. You know, so when you got they were only testing in your system yeah. blowing. Okay. So the alcohol wasn't in, wasn't it was an issue, yes. Did this what wasn't what I got caught at. I got caught at choosing oddball dopaminergic drugs that weren't on the screen. So then one day the medical board comes up with this screen that pretty much tests for everything, including air. Mm. Oh, so you were taking what what were you taking? Uh finmetrazine. Oh. And then some fendimetrazine. So, so speed. Yes. Right, right. Yes. Okay. I'm stimulant, I'm sorry. Stimulant. It's like the appetite yeah. suppressant, the fen fen. Your heart's okay. You weren't yeah. taking that combo. No, no, no. That, no. I wasn't okay. taking it to lose weight, man. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, no, of course. <laughs> <laughs> he was taking it to feel different. And yes, yeah, yes. I just wanted to feel any which way different. Right. right. That's right. And then, so that, then I got, I've got caught a few times on screens and, and tested, and I tested, or test positive. And Gene Degner, here's Gene Degner's coming, name's coming up again. He and a group of doctors would routinely, not routinely, but they met like every month or every, yeah, every month. Harris County Medical Society had a uh, uh, a committee, right? Of which I'm now a member, <laughs> in good standing. <laughs> and so they would confront me. Said, "Listen, Mike, what are you going to do? What are you going to do differently?" I said, "Okay, okay, okay, okay. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what, now I like lay out this really stupid plan, and I could just tell by the way they looked at me. Go like they weren't happy. Go thinking, you know, you're asking for you ask me a question. I'm giving you an answer. Like nobody here seems content with what I'm doing, <laughs> you know. And so for good reason, right? <laughs> And then one day I'd had I'd, something had happened. I, I kind of forgotten exactly what that was. Just a series of events to where I remember I gave up. I gave up. I didn't know what to do. And so I get called before this committee one night and they said, so what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know, man. I don't know what to do. I give up. So they actually were. That, yeah. And then one of the guys, he hits the table and goes, now you got it. I'm thinking, don't mock me, man. I don't know what to do. He goes, now you got it. I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> right. No, I'm, I'm not broken. Don't you get it? I don't know what to do. Right. It's at that point. And, of, I, and I was, and, and, you, you give up, you, you actually surrender. That was it. And it's so empowering. That's why you banged the table. That's it. And pointed at you. But you know what? I didn't get that until I was in rehab. And I remember it was just one, one day, I think it's in a process group. And it occurred to me, you go, that's what he meant. Now you, because, because that's, he saw me get, he saw me, that I was surrendering, giving up. He wasn't making fun. That's what he meant. And I thought. Now's your chance. Yeah. Yeah. I went back and made amends to that board. Hmm. What do you do now when clients are sitting in front of you and they're trying to like give you every answer that under the sun about how the drug screen couldn't possibly po- be positive? It was the poppy seeds from the bagels yeah. that I got from Kroger. Yeah, I, I usually like like a cat with it. Sometimes I'll have fun, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Let them dig a but little bit. But you're really yeah. skilled at it because you yourself were someone that kind of figured it out. I feel like I created a lot of the tricks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so and they're following the lead. Oh, and I thought you were humble. Look at him. Oh. Yeah, humble brag. <laughs> right. my, my wife calls it humble. Oh, humble brag. I'm, oh, Christy, no. We all think that we come up with the tricks, right? <laughs> yeah. But I love hearing new ones. I mean, you know, the thought process, the faulty thought process is the same. But I like when the details, though, make me think for a second. I'm like, okay, that's, that's so crazy. Like stepping on grapes. <laughs> I had that not too long. We had that not too long in what kind? What do you mean? Oh, they were positive because they hey, were stepping oh, on some grapes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I've, I've, I've heard it all too. But yeah. now and again, I'll hear something. That's actually pretty clever. <laughs> What's right. the most clever that you've heard recently? Oh, let me think. Uh, you put me on the spot here, and I, I can't come up with an example. Well, while you're thinking, just for our, you know, our listeners, it's like other doctors or people are like, how can you deal with people that are lying, right? And the thing is, you don't have to believe what they say, but you have to believe that they believe what they say. And the understanding that we that we have by by either going through it or no, or being able to identify it's like it's a survival tool, yeah. you know. The whole deception, like they don't know they're lying. And and I used to like I used to, God, the most crazy lies. The feeling of people talking about you in third person when you're present because of all the lies is is like the worst feeling. Like I I swore when I was like observing people talking about me in the third person because that I, it's like I wasn't even there. Because I lied so much that my credibility was gone. It's like, I swore that I was going to tell the truth, even if I got in trouble. Like, which, by the way, is like easy now, right? Yes. 
Yes. It's so easy. Like, but it's weird. Like, you know, when you when you have to lie in order to survive, you think you need it to survive. Because drugs are basically like oxygen at that point, because withdrawing is so painful that you want to avoid it. Lying becomes such a skill. You do it when it doesn't even matter. And, and you know, I hear comedians talk about I lie for no reason. Like they're not alcoholic, but they're like, so what'd you do today? And I went to the store, but I didn't go to the store. Like, why the hell would I lie? I get that. And, you know, when you get sober, you're supposed to tell on yourself early. And so, you know, you'd be talking to somebody and you'll say something random that, and you're like, okay, wait, I lied. I have no idea why I just said that. And they're, you know, an alcohol, another person in recovery's face is understanding. They're, the other, if the person doesn't do that type of behavior, they look at you like, right, which I get. And I'm like, okay, I'm crazy. You probably don't want to talk to me, but I have to do this in order to like walk the line and be the best version of myself. Now I don't make up stuff. Right. Because hopefully it's because our lives become so full that we don't have to make up or live in kind of a fantasy or create something that may, other people might find acceptable. Yeah, I, that, that sounds great, Julie. I'll, I'll run with that. Or you're only as sick as your secrets. Yeah. And without secrets. No sick. Right. right. Yeah, I like that. That's. Okay. So you get caught multiple times to the point where you lose your license. And I love this because you are seriously smart as a whip. You're a pharmacist, you're a physician. You're now a plumber's assistant. Not that there's anything wrong with plumbers, but like the level of education was incom- was inconsistent with your station in life at that point. Right. What lessons did you learn from that? Because you were, you're a good looking guy. You had women after you, you, you know, you play, you're good at sports, you're smart and you're a plumber's assistant. That can't be easy. It was easier than you might imagine because it's, it's what I needed then. And the job just came along right when I needed it. And it was, it was just what I needed. It was really, if you would have told, if you would have gone back and turned the calendar back and said, oh, look at this crystal ball, Mike, get a little, you're a plumber's helper. I would have thought, no. <laughs> <laughs> good one, good one, good one. Yeah, you, you might know. be going to pharmacy school, but I could tell you exactly what you're doing in 2001. Yeah, and it just, I mean, I'd been, had been part of a very successful practice. I'd done very well. And everything I'd done, I had done pretty well. Exactly. Right? I mean, you're a blessed guy, talent-wise. You were born with a lot of gifts. I was a quick study, I will say, because he did, he did, my plumber company because man, you learn quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Weren't you doing like, in like, like camera insertions and mm-hmm. yeah, so you were doing he some pretty advanced thing. stuff. Yeah. And, and, and I remember he was explaining something to me about like, you know, the hydrodynamics and all that. I said, actually, Kevin, this is sort of like Stark's you know, law. Hemodynamics. Right. right. So right. that's why he goes, How do like, you? I said, it's like hemodynamics. It's like blood flow. Right. Pressure, so, diameter. Yeah. We got that down. That's right. That's right. right. So, right. so some of it sort of came easy and it was fun. I really enjoyed it. It didn't pay well at all. Not <laughs> what I was accustomed to, but it was, I, but I will tell you, I felt good about me. So let me ask you a question. When you bent over, was your crack showing? No, I had to work on that. It would have taken me some more time. <laughs> that's right. Cause you're too yeah, thin. So that's how they knew I wasn't a real plumber. <laughs> that's how they knew I'd never make it in the business. <laughs> you know, so you get your license back, you work in addiction medicine. You know, I was with you. I got recruited away and then Gene retires and you're chief medical officer of the park, which is really big, great facility. Oh, and also like, so now you're like, and, and you're a guy I know that you are, you are great with the patients. You don't like to sit through a lot of meetings, but you have to do this administrative stuff and sort of you see things from now a 20,000 foot view and you have personnel issues and kind of just like, what has been the biggest surprise in that the trajectory of your life has taken? Um, let's start professionally. Yeah. Professionally, I guess the biggest surprise is even though I do a lot of the administrative stuff and I thought that's pretty cool that those guys do that. I realized I like taking care of patients more than I like doing anything. There's not even a close second. Oh, right. No, I know that about you. There's I mean, not I'm, even a close second. I'm so, with you. Yeah. I, I know you are. I, I mean, I, like you could I ask Julie too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like you're like me, like sitting through a meeting. It's like, I feel like I'm a caged tiger a lot. You oh, know, I am. Ugh. that's the one good thing about this corona pandemic is I, I'll choose a computer that doesn't have a camera at work so they can't see the fact that I'm pacing the room. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> they, so we had, a, we, had a, we had a meeting the other day and they were kept trying to FaceTime me and I was like, dude, let me just call because I'm like walking around. I think, I think better walking. Same anyway. here. Yeah. Same here. Like if I'm giving a lecture, I can't, I can't have a podium. I've got to like walk around and I mean, you see, I'm struggling to sit here. I mean, I'm not Italian, but I'm, I'm wave my arms at the time, right? I'm well, you're East, East Texas. Texas hillbilly. Yeah, 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 yeah. East Texas redneck. Yeah, you're East Texas. So, 
Yeah, tell us a little bit about you personally. And, you know, you did touch on the fact you've got you've got a son from one marriage and he's uh, 26, 27? 26, 26. He's, all my three kids are my pride and joy. My wife is my pride and joy. I mean, I'll get choked up talking about I can see that. I mean, yeah. Mike, off, Dr. Leith often says this about people like he's a good egg or she's a good egg. <laughs> and it, it is a hillbilly saying it's, it is, it is a great compliment, salt, salt of the earth. And like the emotion that comes up when you're not, you haven't even gotten a word out. Like you are a great egg. Thank you got to hear that. Thank you. Um, I'm touched coming from you. You're a good friend and have been for many, many years. Thank Thanks, you. man. So I know you're getting choked up. I mean, you've, you've got a wife, a wonderful lady. She's your pride and joy. She could do a lot better than me. She really <laughs> could. I'd say that about my wife as well. I was like, that's the only thing I know for sure. Between the two of us, I scored because. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I, I won. Yeah, definitely. So it's kind of cool when I hear people talking about their relationships and there is a lot of emotion that is exhibited, right? And it is about, in my mind, it's about kind of the quality of the relationship too, because you're so willing to be so complimentary of the other person that's in your life. That's a great piece of information, and it is exactly what people say. The first thing that comes to mind when people talk about Dr. Lee is indeed the fact that you are such a good person. And with that, like I know that your story doesn't necessarily include all those things. Like when we talk about stuff that we've done in our past, that's our past. That's who we were, not who we are now. But it makes, you know, one for good radio, good podcast. But at the same time, like for those folks, like listeners who feel like they're screwing up right and left and things just aren't coming together. And I'm never, I don't have any hope because of all the things that have gone wrong. Look at what happens when it goes right. Yeah. Yeah. Like on that point, there's a story that you told me about when, before you got it, before you surrendered, I think you were on, you were like uh, on the lake, on a boat, you were drunk or something. And this was one, I don't know if you remember the exact. More than likely, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you remember. You, that, okay. So this probably happened more than once. But I was pressing you. It's like when we were working together and we had some downtime, I was pressing you. It was like, I can't believe you relapsed. Because I'm like, when you meet somebody who's in recovery that clearly has it, it's hard to see a different person, right? right. So you were somebody that, that had it, right? And like when, once you surrender, I mean, obviously relapse is possible, but there is, there is this like level of recovery. Like when you absolutely, when you, when you got it and you're in that moment, of course, tomorrow's tomorrow, but like, you were a humble guy. You were in recovery. There wasn't any like gray zone, right? And I was pressing you. I'm like, dude, there's no way you're dumb enough to relapse when you're on a board order. First of all, like that's just, that's just crazy to me. Cause I was, I was on a board order and we'd have to wake up and like call this number. And if it was, I mean, you know, call number, if it was our Today's color, we'd color have to go red. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> so, so we were, so we're both in the, te- you know, the board of medical examiners in Texas was ruthless. It was a hanging court. I, they they were a hanging court. Like they would shoot first and ask questions later. So so Mike's smart. He's got it. He's in recovery. And he was dumb enough to relapse while under board order, which I couldn't understand. I'd have nightmares that I didn't call the number. And I'd wake up like in sweat, you know, just like, oh shit. But oh, thank God it's a dream. And so so I was pressing you. One of the stories you said, there's something like, yeah, man, I was an idiot. You know, I like, I did you get like a ticket on the lake for being drunk or something like that? I did. Yeah. So, okay. So it's that story, right? You're like, man, I wasn't always like this. And it's just amazing that the gratitude that I have getting to do what I do for a living is so rewarding. Probably every day. I mean, it's better than doing family medicine when you, you feel, I just didn't get that sense of, of like reward because people, when people get better in what we do, they get really better Mm -hmm. and their families get better. And then they come back and they're like, you saved my life. And it tickles me like, well, we didn't. You did the work, but it's great to like see that. Yeah. And I get a lot of that. And and so often, I mean, there, there's a guy in particular, I mean, he, he, he credits me with saying something, but I'm telling you, it's something that you've heard, you've heard all the time. For whatever reason, he heard it coming out of my mouth. And all these many years later, he goes, doctor, you changed me. I'm thinking, okay. Do you even remember saying it? Uh-huh. Oh, so that's uh-huh. cool. That's uh-huh. good. Uh-huh. Yeah, I do. I mean, he was, uh, he's good. I cannot do this. I cannot, I cannot look ahead and plan on being sober the rest of my office. It's, well, don't worry about it. You're going to drink today. He goes, I'm not going to drink today. I said, stop. Fine. Mm. Next day, you know, he goes to the same thing. He says, stop. Are you going to drink today? You're going to get drunk? He goes, no, I'm not going to drink today. He said, mm. Move on. And after a series of days, he just said, this is all I do, isn't it? One day at a time. Said, <laughs> One day at a time. Ding, ding, ding. And, but, but how many, that's just like, a mantra, but he heard it out of my mouth. Yeah. And though being able to redirect somebody was something that Zen, simple, 
simple, okay, I get it. Like simple to say, but very difficult to grasp and follow. Yeah. Kind of like when you surrendered and you're like, you're making fun of me. Right. Exactly. It's, I love these, I love these epiphany moments. Yeah. Being around you like more than I think, and and you guessed up to this point, like I, I am feeling the enrichment of what we do for a living. It's great. And I love what I do. And I know when I first got into it many years ago that I thought I was going to do for a few months and get back to the ER. One of the things that was sort of objected to is that it's just, it's just all gray. You know, I was trained in hard science, hard medicine. Right. If it was broken, you straightened it. If it was cut, you closed it. If it was, you know, you, the labs were out of whack, you made them normal. And I thought, this is just too much like psychiatry. <laughs> but now, and, and it is very much like psychiatry. And now I, like psychiatry, I, do, I do now enjoy psychiatry, but we have such science now backing up what we do. Yeah. You know, and that, that's just eat that stuff up. I'm going to, on that point, like before we do the positive intervention, I want to, I want to ask you this. So what new science, what new tool have you found to be the most useful? I use a lot of naltrexone, a lot. That's what I would, that's what I would answer as well. I love it. I I like vivid. I don't mean to give a place to say I I like the injectable depot. I am injectable naltrexone. And that, that naltrexone is um, a medication that's been around for a while that can reverse uh, an opiate overdose, but we found that it actually helps alcoholism. And I'm not getting into off-label uses, but creatively, there's people that have like come to me with other things like gambling and have asked for it. Yes. And, you know, I'm not going to talk about off-label uses of med. That's not what this platform no, is for. It's pretty safe. And, and it's, these are all dopamine. You know, yeah. they, they, they trigger this circuit in the brain that releases dopamine, sort of our feel-good hormone. And, and now Truxton has a way of blocking one of those circuits. So, it stands to reason it might work. And if you use it and it works, fantastic. As long as there's no side yeah. effects. And I mean, I was a late adopter to it because I, I was counting on, on our patients having a sense of reward and motivation and pleasure when they do things that don't involve drugs and alcohol. And I was afraid that it would, it would block that. Right. And so I didn't, I didn't listen to drug reps. You know, I wouldn't listen to doctors that were on the paycheck. Uh, and then when enough doctors I respected said, no, this doesn't have that effect which is nobody can explain why, because it blocks natural endorphins. It can, you know, it can act as a, a reversal of pain medicine, analgesia. Yeah. And, and even in the placebo. So it does, so we know that it affects reversal of the in, analgesia that's produced by natural endorphins. Because if you give somebody a placebo opiate and they say, oh yeah, the pain's gone. And then you give them naltrexone, it reverses that. Right. So that's the endogenous opiate. Right. I can't explain it. I mean, but it doesn't have that effect. So I started but, but it using didn't create it. Anhed- anhedonia, uh, I poor you just right. unable to achieve pleasure. That was all our fear. Right. Were you a late adopter? I can't remember. Were you an early adopter? I don't think you. No, did. I was. I was probably middle. I would. Yeah, I was right in the middle because it, it just part of that didn't make sense for the same reasons you described. But so you, for the, our listeners in layman's terms, could you please very simply describe why you would recommend the injectable naloxone? Naltrexone. Naltrexone. Com- sorry. Compliance. Compliance. Which means what? Means sticking with something every day, right? So, and and I see this. It hadn't happened today. So, okay, today's an exception. But but I'll bet three or four times out of every week, sometimes more, I'll have a patient that'll relapse on the pills. And I said, but you assured me you didn't need the shot because you'd take the pill. They relapsed day. when they were taking the oral form, the yeah, pill form, because they weren't taking it every day. So when you like press them on this, they go, you know what? I just, I said, man, I was just feeling fine. Yeah, I didn't need it. complacency. Complacency. And then they stop taking the medicine, which if you get the shot form, it lasts for a month. Yeah, and you don't have to wake up one day and decide to take it or not take it. It's in your system. Right, and also with the with the pills, you kind of get these peaks and troughs every day with the blood levels. It's, it's typically the the peaks of the blood levels where you're going to have some side effects, if any. Right. So the the shot has this nice, elegant delivery system. We're not getting those peaks, so people tend to do well. But it's a shot. Some people hate shots. Right. So I can say it because I will. So Vivitrol injections is what we're talking about, and for our listeners, um, it really does help reduce cravings for opioids, and it's also and effective alcohol. in alcohol. Yeah, right. So, and for those who do drink on it, the relapses are shorter and less intense. Absolutely, though, so, the Sinclair method. It is, but don't. But not the shot. I don't want to. I don't right. want to. Right. Right. Gonna, right. <laughs> we have some educated listeners that would do their research anyway, but it is akin to that, and not that I'm plugging it, but it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks very much for sharing that. Okay, so now we're going to roll into the part of our podcast. Yeah. So this is the how to perma section. Um, the positive intervention is included here. And it, it's because we had some listeners say, hey, man, that's a great podcast, but how do we improve well-being? And, and we did have a mechanism in there because, 
in this daily guide, every day is a positive intervention, which is an intentional act um, that's evidence-based. So either theory or application that improves where you find human happiness. So positivity, engagement, relationship, meaning, or achievement. So Julie, you want to lead us in the how-to PERMA? Absolutely. So for today's PI, which we sent in advance to Dr. Leith, it was to exercise your body and mind. First, be mindful of what you put into your body. If you must smoke, have one less cigarette today. Drink one less caffeinated beverage today. Eat fewer processed and more whole foods. Eat a variety of darker green and blue fruits and vegetables. Make breakfast your largest meal and dinner your smallest. And then tonight or today, journal about how this PI made you feel. And perhaps you might want to repeat today's choices tomorrow. So kind of in line with what you were saying to your patient too, that time where you were saying, did you drink today? And yeah. no, he did not. But so how did you kind of apply this PI and what was your kind of response to it? To, to wake up early and to, to try to exercise and do some sort of my routine anyway. But I, at least I did it today with this in mind, <laughs> <laughs> you know, thinking about that. And as far as my diet goes, my wife makes this really easy. She's a great cook and she chooses well. So, but my breakfast won't be my largest meal. No. <laughs> so, so doing the exercise with this in mind, did you have any different experience or no? Cause you do, you basically run every day or well, I don't hobble it. anymore. Oh, I'm really? Hobble. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I run not nearly as much just because I got joint pains now. Uh, and you're so not taking little... Vicodin to cover it up. That's I'm good. not taking Vicodin to cover it up. There you go. But there are other things you can do. Absolutely. Swimming. Increasing, right. Increasing, increasing your core strength, yoga. And I, and I do do other things. I'm just, but I miss running. Sure. You know, I live over by Rice. It's quite a great place to run. Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, so you see me walking more than running. So I'm definitely excluding myself from this PI. Like, <laughs> I struggle. <laughs> I didn't do anything with intention that would do well for this for today. So um, I'm going to work on this one again, though. But Dr. Powers, how about you? So, yeah, I did. Um, so I've got a heavy bag. And I've got like a great man cave study thing and it's got, it's got like a, you know, like a little gym, little home gym thing. And I, and I hung a heavy bag, which is pretty funny because like I hung it with this carpent, like master carpenter friend of mine and it fell down. And then I'm like, okay, did it again, kept falling. So finally I figured out how to keep it up. So it's up. But like, there was, there was like a permanent ladder up in my study and I was always calling my <laughs> wife or my, you know, my kids to help put it back up, but I, I figured it out. I white wall, I fixed the white wall. Um, I've been boxing, I've been boxing and I have, I have boxing elbow. I'm just like tennis. I have basically lateral epicondylitis, but dude, I love it. So I've normally been, <laughs> I'm normally do like 10 rounds of three minutes with like a 15 second break. And it, dude, it's not like I'm getting hit while I'm doing it. So it's not what you, it's not as, but it's still it is, workout. It is. Though. It's hard right. when you're, yeah, yeah it's, it's tough. So actually I, um, you know, so today I did it twice with this in mind. And I'm like, I'm pretty, doing pretty well. Like, you know, I've got the, the reason why this intervention is, is in, and it's not just, Hey guys, exercise. Like we, we know if you do 20 to 30 minutes of intense exercise, you get a 12 hour mood boost. So that's evidence-based. Absolutely. And wait, say that again. You get, if you do, so the study was 20 minutes of intense exercise daily, you get about an eight to 10 hour boost in your mood. Mm-hmm. And, and, and anecdotally, absolutely. I've experienced that good, every day. Perfect. But also it's, it's also evidence-based, also based on like endorphin release, dopamine release, and subjective measures. And then there's a great book that I'm going to plug by Tom Rath called Eat, Move, Sleep. And it, it's something that's evidence-based to do every day in the category of taking care of your body. So eating, exercising, and sleeping. And it's really important. And what he found is that the darker the fruit or vegetable, the better the benefit. And then people that have I think it's five servings of fruits and vegetables a day have improved mood over those that don't. Huh. So that's why, that's why interventions like that are kind of scattered throughout the book. Right. And for our listeners, like this is, in, especially those in early recovery, looking for that mood boost, right? 12 hours? Yeah. So it can last up to 12 hours. It's about, I think it's about 10 on average, but I really feel easy, like, through I, work day for sure. Yeah, easily. Yeah, I like it. Tomorrow, I'm definitely going to go back to day 11 and, and do that and test it myself. <laughs> I have to own the fact that I did not today. Oh, but as far as diet goes, like, I, okay, I failed on the diet part. The exercise, yes. But like, I am figuring out how to increase the COVID number. It's like, I used to be COVID 20, 25, 40. <laughs> but I, it's like my daughter's birthday. I made these like killer s'mores cookies. I made like, you know, when I watch YouTube, they, there's always like, ads that are, you know, consistent with whatever your search is. 
And and I'll admit it, I like cat videos. So I get like a whole bunch of ads, I'm sure that are, you know, geared for like women that are housekeeper. But because I'm just guessing like who watches most of cat videos, I'm in that demographic uh-huh. now. So and I get a lot of s'mores commercials. Huh. huh. And I am never seen craving that. s'mores. Thank God there's no crack commercials. <laughs> so there's this weird thing between cat lovers and s'mores. I don't, I don't know. know. Maybe we have time at home, you know, cooking. That's why I made it up. So for um, next week's um, positive intervention, day 12, for those of you that have and are following along in the positive recovery daily guide, this is a really good one. The quote is, don't cry because it is over. Smile because it happened. And the positive intervention is, it is one thing to overcome hardships and another to survive good fortune with grace. So much has been written about forgiveness and trauma resolution, and people often focus significant energy on learning how to cope with difficult times. They do not, however, apply themselves equally to examining and improving how to navigate good times. Too often, people lose their serenity in good times by clutching desperately to those wonderful things they receive. When fortune smiles upon people, it can be easy to forget gratitude and impermanence and begin to expect that these conditions will last forever. Yet the only constant is change. How easily people forget this in moments of bliss. The mind naturally attaches to the good, but frequently this is an unexpected source of pain and suffering. When people grasp too tightly to the good things, they can suffer just as much as when they try to change or push away the bad things. In attempting to avoid the bad stuff, People sometimes risk striving for artificial and unachievable safe zones. They try to avoid the pain of ever having to lose another thing that they love. So for the PI for next week is, what are you holding on to today? Are you living to shield yourself from pain or are you living courageously? Can you try to let go of fear today? Apply energy today to noticing what you are holding on to and why. At the end of the day, journal about your experience. This is a great one. Like, this is one that I know, like, on a daily, I could use with our clients. Dude, me too. I got goosebumps. I was like, yeah. Oh my God, it's very Buddhist, right? Who said the quote? Anonymous. Oh, he says a lot of good stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> kind of like Jones. TBD. Where's TBD to be determined? But for a long time, <laughs> I was trying to figure out what TBD was. <laughs> Yeah. I was a lot younger than I was. I'm talking about when I was like 12 or 13. Well, that's okay. When I first started going to 12 step meetings and people would say friend of Bill, I thought they were talking about this guy, Bill Hay, who I saw at meetings at Post Oak and Delta. And so when I was in Austin and they said, Hey, you know, I'm friend of Bill. I'm like, how does this guy get around? Everybody knows Bill. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> awesome. So thank you so much, Dr. Mike Leith for, uh, for coming on, man. It's great to see you. Dr. Jason Powers, Julie, thank y'all for having me. This has been a tr- truly a treat. Thank you. Thank cool. You. And we have a gift for you. We do. Which we I do. think I sent you because you probably, I used you for a quote, I'm sure. But now you have another one. I think I had, yeah, cool. Yes, thank you. You got it. So you can look back on day 12 if you ever want to remember who wrote, don't cry because it is over, smile because it happened. I love that. Awesome. I love that. Thanks. Thank All you. right, signing off. Bye. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for listening to this episode of Positive Recovery MD. Don't forget to visit PositiveRecoveryMD.com to sign up to get your daily positive intervention sent straight to your inbox. Be sure to subscribe to Positive Recovery MD on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts to receive an automatic download when a new episode drops. And as always, if you or someone you know needs help, visit PositiveRecovery.com or call 877-4-SOBRIETY which is 877-476-2743. We are here to help.